afternoon, everyone. I'm Lieutenant General Papaquist in U.S. Army, retired. I'm the Vice President for Membership and Meetings for the Association of the United States Army. And it's my great privilege, uh, on behalf of General Ham, who's uh, lost his voice a little bit here, <laughs> I welcome you to this afternoon's special session. It is a great honor for us to host this forum, particularly so soon after the announcements made at this annual meeting from the Secretary of Defense, our Acting Secretary of the Army, Mr. McCarthy, and the Army Chief of Staff, General Milley, about new approaches to research and development, acquisition, and industry relationships. It's my honor to introduce Ms. Stephanie Easter. She is the um, senior official performing the duties of the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology. New title. <laughs> and in this role, she is the Senior Procurement Executive and Army Acquisition Executive, responsible for leading and supervising Army Acquisition, Procurement, Research and Development, and Logistics endeavors within the Army Acquisition Enterprise. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> she also oversees the development of policies and programs and processes to streamline Army Acquisition efforts. Uh, this forum is going to be a kind of fireside chat discussion that they will lead, and uh, then there will be questions and answers. There are question cards being circulated around, so please fill out those questions. We'll get them up here as soon as possible. And now I turn it over to Ms. Easter. Thank you Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much, General McQuestion. And good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Great. Exactly. I can't think of no better place to be than to have the opportunity to be here with Miss Ellen Lord. It is a great pleasure to um, have the opportunity to sit down and talk to her. I just, I'm going to introduce her. That's why she was not introduced earlier, because there's some things I want to make sure that everybody knows about this phenomenal leader that we have with us. As you know, uh, Miss Ellen Lord is the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics, as well as Defense Acquisition Executive. And that's where a lot of us um, deal with her from that perspective. But there's a couple things in her biography that I want to point out to you so you guys can get a feeling of just what she does. So in this capacity, she's responsible to the Secretary of Defense for all matters pertaining to the acquisition, research and engineering, developmental testing, contract administration, logistics and material readiness, installations and environment, operational energy, chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons, the acquisition workforce, and the industrial base. Wow. <laughs> so how do you do that? <laughs> thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, everyone, for being here. It's really exciting to be in this role. A lot going on, broad portfolio. I actually didn't realize I would be so involved in hurricane relief and talking um, to the Department of Homeland Security about the Jones Act being waived and so forth. Um, but it's incredibly interesting, and it's amazing what the department does. In fact, I'm not sure if everyone fully appreciates the amount of time effort and money that has gone into supporting the hurricanes. Um, every Tuesday and Thursday morning, all the unders and the secretaries of the services meet with Secretary Mattis and we talk about critical events, what's going on um, in the near term, what has just transpired. An enormous amount of our energy recently has gone on hurricane support and rightly so. So it's amazing um, the tens of millions of meals we've supplied and all the different things and I've gotten to learn a lot about transportation. Yes. <laughs> well, we really appreciate it. With everything going on, you taking the time to be here today means even more to us. Absolutely. So thank you for that. As you know, Ms. Lord um, has a critical position at, at a critical time in our defense history. You've heard a lot today over the last couple of days about all the changes that are going on in the Department of Defense, but specifically within the Army. And I think we're very fortunate to have a leader like Ellen Lord to come in with her industry experience to give us a different perspective on things. As most of you know, she comes to us from Textron, where she served as over 30 years as a president and CEO. So she she knows our business. <laughs> She's been on the other side for a while. And we've heard a lot about the importance of collaboration with industry. And so therefore, she will bring a unique perspective. So can you share with us a little bit about 
what it's like seeing things from the other side? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's very, very interesting because my perspective is influenced by 33 years in a multi-industry company. I did about 11 years in the automotive sector and then the balance in aerospace and defense. And when I interviewed with Secretary Mattis, he told me that he really wanted to transform the way DOD does business and to become much, much more commercial. So I don't think it's any accident that the Deputy Secretary of Defense, um, Pat Shanahan, who comes from Boeing, and I are in our positions um, because that's exactly what we're trying to do. It's all about velocity and getting cost out to get um, a kit downrange to the warfighter fast and at a really good value. Well, you're definitely um, in line where we know the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary want to go. I believe it was such a confirmation hearing when you made a comment along the lines of, you know, getting an 80% solution out there quickly yeah. is better than and more useful than having an elegant solution that gets there too late. Yeah. So confirmation, that's something everybody should experience once in their <laughs> life, um, quite, quite an experience. But I think that's how we're trying to do business in the department now. We're trying to get solutions quickly. We're trying to experiment. We're trying to prototype. And we're trying to iterate and get stuff downrange quickly. So it's a little bit of a different philosophy. We're trying to get the risk out early on in the process versus when materials fielded. Well, I know firsthand, ma'am, about um, your commitment to what we're doing um, because I get to work with her on a regular basis. And I've had the opportunity to see firsthand your passion about taking care of the services. So I wanted to thank you publicly for the time that you've taken to reach out to the services as you've taken your new well, position. Well, I think that's critical because my model is that I look at DOD like I look at a corporation. Um, we have customers. Our customers, the warfighter, the COCOMs, are a very, very important part of that. And I look at OSD as a corporate entity. So what have we done in industry over the last 10 years or so? We've looked at what is critical to the P&Ls, uh, the services now as I see it in DOD, and we're about enabling them not just overseeing what's going on. And it's really our responsibility to make sure the services are successful, they get what they need as soon as possible, and at a very, very good price. Now, it's, it's interesting because when I walked in to the Pentagon, I was used to the construct I knew in industry where if you're a leader of a larger business, every day you have your finance person on one side and your HR person on the other side because human capital is what makes it all work and you have to live by the numbers. And we have very big numbers we're dealing with. Right now, DCMA, for instance, is overseeing $6.5 trillion worth of contracts. Um, Non-trivial. We have programs of record right now. If you look out about 10 years, about $1.9 trillion. We're putting $300 billion um, on contract each year. And people don't always appreciate that half of that is for products and the other half is for services. So how do we measure the effectiveness of that? How do we measure the return on that? Um, I'm very, very interested in making sure that it in addition to EVMS and all the important things we do, that we actually are looking at our finances on a monthly basis and seeing how we're doing spending that money. Um, are we spending it on the right things? Um, are we getting things obligated? Are we getting a return on that investment? I'm also extremely interested in how we deal with our talent because one of the things that I think is absolutely critical is making sure that you have cutting edge skills. And obviously the world is changing around us pretty quickly and we need to make sure we keep bringing people in and out of DOD. And I think the services perhaps are a little bit ahead of OSD on doing that. So we need to really do an inventory of what we have in terms of human capital and make sure we're getting those people experiences to broaden and deepen their perspectives. So that probably doesn't mean 
means staying in the same job for 20, 30 years. That means moving around, other than if you're a critical program manager on a major program, because I think sometimes we do ourselves disservices by moving people on critical programs too quickly. Well, I mean, you guys can see how busy my life is going to be between the charges I've been getting, giving from the chief of staff of the Army and the secretary of the Army. Now I'll call my other boss. Yeah, you know, but, I just laid out all these things that I'm going to have to do. But the good news so. is, the good news is that we're communicating a lot. And I yes. think that's a real tribute to Secretary Mattis. And he's been so clear about his objectives. There are three lines of effort. There's lethality. There's ally, um, allies and partners, and then there's reform. And what makes all of that happen is really communicating clearly and often, and he's absolutely excellent at that. And one of the things that I decided week one was that if I'm kind of in the corporate part of the DOD, it's all about enabling the services, and that means working and communicating with them. So I meet with each of the service acquisition executives on a weekly basis. We meet together, we meet individually to understand what's going Going on what needs to be done to make sure we've got the right talent in the right places and we don't have different islands of isolated activity that are uninformed about similar things going on because we've got a lot of work to do so we want to make sure we all line up and spread that out and do it in um, a very complementary way. Yeah, so this is going to be very important for us in the Army. You know, you've heard the Chief of Staff and the Secretary lay out our top six um, priorities. So we'll be working with you closely to make sure that they're aligned with the overall vision of what the Secretary is, is going towards. And also, from an acquisition workforce perspective, you know, in the Army, we're launching our human capital strategy for our acquisition workforce as well. And that'll be lined up very much with the vision where you want to go. So I look forward to working with you on that. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, um, the enthusiasm of Ryan McCarthy is fantastic. Yes. He actually stopped me in the hall one day and said, Ellen, wait, wait, wait. I want you to come to AUSA. And I'm really excited to be here. This is the first um, major event I've been to. Yes. So it's great to be here with the Army. Oh, great. Well, we're glad to have you because we've got a lot going on. You know, you probably heard from the secretary as well. You know, we talked about the number of products. We have so many programs within the Army. Um, at last count, it was like 840-something. And so one of the things that we're talking about is the role of OSD. You know, as we work through, can you share a little bit about your concept of oversight versus Absolutely. insight Absolutely. versus support? So Congress has been very, very clear in the last few NDAAs that they want to shift oversight of most programs back to the services. And I entirely agree with that. In fact, there are some programs that were transitioned back earlier this year. I'm reviewing um, all of the MDAPs, all the major defense um, programs right now and looking at transitioning the bulk of those back. Where I think it makes sense to stay um, within at and in OSD is where they're very joint, yes. because that's where I believe we need to be as OSD. Just like in a corporation, when you have a major program that goes across um, a few different P&Ls, where you have programs um, that are both with the Air Force and the Navy, like Joint Strike Fighter, for instance, or you have exceptionally high risk and high stakes. Those are the programs that will stay within um, ATNL, working very closely with the services. Yes. And what we want to do is leverage individuals that have had the opportunity to work across multiple programs with multiple services so that they have a breadth and depth of experience that they can bring to bear on those. But where we really want to see ATNL focusing is how to simplify the acquisition process. Um, there is an incredible amount of bureaucracy. Just the way we make decisions and the time it takes, we're looking at paring that down. And how do you start? You start with the simple everyday things and just bang them away. Now, we obviously have lots of suggestions um, from Congress and lots of language in the NDAAs that drive an enormous amount of reporting and doing things certain ways. 
Um, what I've been incredibly encouraged by is as I work with staffers, as I work with members, and frankly, I was a little bit ignorant coming into this job as to how tightly paired Congress and the Pentagon are, but I think that's a good thing. There's an ongoing dialogue, and I have found an enormous amount of receptivity to saying, boy, this doesn't make sense to me, that doesn't make sense to me, um, the following thing doesn't make sense to me. What about um, peeling those back? And I'm not ready to talk to you about a lot of specifics today because we're kind of in the midst of it, and I want to protect that dialogue that's going on. But I am extremely encouraged by what I see, and I think, frankly, these NDAAs have gotten longer and longer and more directive and more directive because we perhaps haven't been responding the way we could um, within the building. And so one of the major objectives I have is to clear some of that out. And Thank you. I want to take advantage of a lot of the authorities we've been given because, frankly, we talk about acquisition reform all the time. But there are an incredible number of flexibilities we have right now that we're not taking advantage of. And I think that's because we've developed an extremely risk averse culture because we make you know public exhibitions out of those that have stumbled, right? So what we need to do is start getting all that stumbling much, much earlier in the process, working things out risk-wise early in the technology development phases. So by the time we get to low rate production and full rate production, we kind of know where we are. But I'm very, very encouraged by what I see as a Congress that's pretty much aligned with where we need to go, and I think we can navigate that and get going. So, well, that's an excellent segue. She talked about language that's coming out and how we need to change the way we do business and the focus on S and T and research and engineering. So, language has a reorganization of AT and L um, that needs to be put in place by February of this year. Can you share with us um, your vision of how you see? the, um, I'll say, the separation of AT&L into the r and &E and the a and s and anything Absolutely. you can share on that? Yeah, you know, I think everybody gets caught up about a bunch of boxes and who's in the box and where the lines go and hook together. The way I'm looking at this is initially just trying to sort through what is the work being done in ATNL right now. What's being done on the R and E side? What's being done um, on the A and S side? And my initial conclusion is we spend an incredible amount of time on the acquisition side and very, very little time on the sustainment side. And when you look over the life cycle of most of our programs, it's about 70% on the sustainment side. So we need to get that right. Um, so we're trying to understand what is the body of work being done and how can we support the services to get on contract faster, for instance. So we're taking little bites at things before we do major reorganizations. I have the team working on a project. Again, we're trying to iterate very quickly on projects and get some quick wins looking at reducing the time it takes to get on contract by 50%. So how are we going to do that? Um, we are looking at all the requirements out there. We're looking at TINA, and we're literally coming up with flow charts for program managers and contract officers as to if I want that, then how can I do it? What is the simplest way to get there and still be compliant? Yes. And we're actually um, working through with each of the services, um, kind of at a beta site, one program for each service using that. And, oh, by the way, we're working with industry to try to help them do that as well. Industry is at least 50% of this, if not more, in terms of helping us sort out where we go. And I've tried to be thoughtful about interfacing with industry. I want to be very, very respectful of the services, what the secretaries and what the chiefs are doing, what the acquisition executives are doing. So I've decided, other than for extraordinary reasons, I'm not taking many one-on-one -on -one meetings with industry. What I'm trying to do is leverage a lot of 
of really great organizations out there to bring small, medium, large industry together so that I can go with key members of my team and the extended team. So for instance, I said that three, one of the three of Secretary Mattis's focus areas is building partnerships and alliances. I take General Hooper from DSCA with me when I have a big meeting with industry because that international partnership is so very important. Um, and what we're doing is we're working with industry to try to figure out how to get faster. So just last week, for instance, to be a little bit more specific, I had my first meeting with industry um, in a forum that was sponsored by AIA, NDIA, and PSC. And what we asked them to do was to bring six or so um, CEOs from each of their member companies, making sure that we got a broad range of small, medium, and large companies. And it was their agenda to talk about about where um, their issues were, how we could do things better, and we had a great dialogue. So I'm going to have a cadence of those. We're doing four of those a year. I'm also pulling in our six largest primes for meetings um, inside of the Pentagon. I'm doing one a month, so each of the key six um, primes will get two a year. We did the first one with General Dynamics just yesterday, and what it was, it was a dialogue with GD executives and DOD executives, um, mostly at &L, but again, pulling in some others as well, talking about where we had concerns, um, where we saw opportunities, allowing them to bring up where they had questions, yes. opportunities, and just really having a dialogue. So I think that that is very, very important because I want to look at suppliers from a portfolio point of view and not just get caught up in each program. The services are managing most of the individual programs. I want to look at capabilities, um, where people are investing, IR and D. I think the I, the independent part of IRAD, is very important. That's why we rolled back the reporting relationships, which I just saw as one more level of bureaucracy, not really adding any value. And so these dialogues are important, and what we're trying to do is get at all of this. But in the long run, relative to this reorganization, I'm trying to get ANS more on the front end before the RFPs get released to talk about what are those architectures we need, what are some of the standards we need as we begin to fight more multi-domain battles when we have the different services working together. We need to be interoperable. We have to have all the systems communicate with one another. We have to be able to share data. We have to be able to mine that data. So I think what acquisition and sustainment can do is get back at what are those standards, what are those architectures, so that we can have our services working together on the battlefield along with our allies and partners as well. Then on the R&E side, we have this great number of federated labs out there, whether they be the service labs, whether they be the FFRDCs, and we have, again, a lot of what I call islands of excellence going on. I'd like to try to get that a little bit more aligned, not to consolidate all of these. We want to keep all the independent spirit and all of the personalities, if you will, of the different services, mm -hmm. of the different organizations. But I don't think we have enough time and we don't have as many dollars as we need to have things be unaligned. So I would love to see a couple national level initiatives. And as we work through our national defense strategy, which will come out late this year, I think you will see us very aligned in trying to get all of DOD together on the same vector on a couple big programs to make a difference. OK, well, that's encouraging to hear because um, I know in the Army, and for those the Army people out here want to know, when we heard about the split up of AT&L into a and s and RE, one of the questions I get a lot of times is, was the Army going to reorganize? So for the record, no. We are not planning to split up the um, AAE within the Army into an r and &E and an a and &S. We will continue to work the seams with um, OSD, at and as we go you forward. You know, Stephanie, you bring up a really important point about seams. Yes. Um, as we take and bifurcate ATNL, 
one of the things that we are very, very conscious of is that we don't want to develop a chasm between ANS and RE. And we want to make sure that we have flexible acquisition vehicles for the RE team to use, just like we do in ANS. And we want to make sure that there's a good handoff there. So um, we don't want to leave that to the force of personalities. Um, we don't want a valley of death. Um, so what we are doing is we are being very thoughtful about putting mechanisms in to make sure that there are good handoffs. But again, we want to do lots of experimentation, prototyping, um, demonstrations and iterations early on in the R&E side of things so that we're not doing that on the ANS side as we get into programs where we sometimes get into a lot of concurrent engineering and changes and yes. so forth. Well, I feel um, very excited hearing you say that, ma'am, because I think what you're asking for is right in alignment with what we intend to do in the Army and what we've been hearing you know, pretty consistently from the Army leadership across the board. So we look forward to that. So I would like to transition to you. we got a whole stack of questions here. Good. Um, we're going to get some of these going, and I'm going to have to put my glasses on because some of the handwriting isn't as neat as I thought it was going to be. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. So contracting. <laughs> How will the same urgency and velocity for requirements and programs extend to increasing the RFI to the contractor? 600 to 1,000 days, period. Is it possible for 12 months RFP to award? I think you kind of talked about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so I think the whole idea um, here, the gist of it is the cycle is too long, um, gathering information and then going out for RFPs and so forth. There is an enormous appetite to speed that up, and I think um, if we get aligned, we can get a lot of activity in the S&T community to start generating capabilities, actual systems that will inform what we're doing in terms of the art of the possible, going out and looking at new systems um, and new, um, basically, mission profiles because I think we want to get a little bit more mission centric in what we're doing versus just capability centric yes. be very focused on what is the objective and we want to roll that back so every single part of the process from I don't control requirements um, joint staffs doing a lot of that mm -hmm. but we are in um, a lot of discussion and we are tightly linked, but we are doing everything possible to shorten that cycle on the um, whole RFI, RFP side. And we're going to start small and practice sort of new behaviors on some smaller programs with each of the services and continue to work it. Yeah, and internal to the Army, we've taken a couple of steps just recently um, when we started doing incremental releases of RFPs. So with Mobile Protective Firepower, we sent out a small section of the RFP package, got comments from industry, then sent out a little bit more the next time. So we did like two or three releases on that RFP before it went out. And the feedback we're getting from industry is that's very important. They yeah. like that a lot because it gave them an opportunity to collaborate yeah. you know, in a way that they have not had the opportunity to before. I should just be very clear. We will put metrics around all of this because if we don't have a goal that's measurable, it's impossible to determine progress against it. So as we refine what we're doing here in the Ooh. dark, um, the, um, <laughs> we um, will be a little bit crisper about that. Okay. Um, this one's on talent management. Um, a new directive was recently signed. Okay, I think this is an Army one, so I'll take this. A new directive was recently signed regarding talent management in the acquisition community. What does this say, and how will you implement it? Um, and this is Scott, you put your name on there, so I want to make sure I'm getting at your question. I assume that you're referring to the directive that the Secretary mentioned in his remarks of how um, he signed a directive. Basically, what that directive focuses on internal to Army is making sure that the people we have in acquisition positions have the training and certification that they need on day one. Another part of it is making sure that we have well-rounded individuals leading. I mean, you may have picked up the secretary's comment about how he would love a program manager to come up that has some operational experience. 
So that's a part of the directive, and we're working very closely with him on that. Believe it or not, the majority, if not all, of our acquisition program managers right now come into the job with operational experience. They're not grown as acquisition professionals from day one. So we think we're not going to have any problem meeting that part of the requirement. The other part, which is probably the newest part, which I'll be working with you on, Ms. Lord, is to make sure that we have similar training for the people who write requirements as we do for the program managers. That's another part of the talent management. We started recently working with DAU to get a requirements writing officers class yes. to kind of this is such, excuse me, yes. I no can't problem. help myself. This okay. is such an important point. <laughs> this is great. I cannot tell you um, how many people have come up to me inside of the Pentagon and said, DAU does some great things. However, I don't believe we're really contemporary. I'll use my words in terms of yes. what we're doing. And in fact, we had a senior leadership conference um, Secretary Mattis did on Friday with all the COCOMs and four stars. Um, and the secretaries, and I was talking about my direction in terms of where I was going with reorganizing ATNL, and I made the point that we're looking very, very hard at DAU and what we're doing there, how we're training people, yes. kind of hearkening back to the point I made that out of the 300 billion that we release a year um, in terms of obligations out of DOD, 50% of that is for service contracts. We do not do a lot of training on service contracts. Yes. Um, and yeah. then we also don't always look at all of the interfaces, if you will, to AT&L. So, you know, kind of putting an engineering perspective on this, we always know that the interface control documents are a key part of any systems engineering problem and that when you have systems failures, it's usually the interfaces of the different subcomponents, components where you have issues. Uh, we cannot simplify and speed up the acquisition process if we are not aligning that very, very closely with DCMA and DCAA yes. and the auditing processes. And I think especially when we talk about foreign military sales where industry has a lot of challenges where often you are selling the same system to two or three different countries within the same year or two and maybe a map card is all the only difference between weapon systems, yet you go back to square one in terms of auditing which takes months upon months upon months. Yes. We're trying to get at that and do things concurrently. Um, DCMA falls under my purview, so talking to Admiral Lewis about that, he's absolutely committed. We're working hard on that. Um, talking to Anita at DCAA, she's also um, very committed to that as well. Um, we have about 400,000 contracts right now that we're trying to close out. You know, it's just amazing um, looking at incurred cost. So we, we just have to get better at this, and that gets back to another big theme we're looking at is if you look at the Department of Defense um, next to the talent, the human capital, what is what are our real assets? It's our data. That's really our intellectual property. And we are looking at how we bring that data together, how we manipulate it more, how we get to machine learning, how we get to big data analytics to figure out how to close these contracts and so forth. So that's an enormous area of focus and opportunity, I think, for us and some place that we want to be much, much more like industry, especially I mentioned the sustainment costs, yes. and we know that's about 70 cents on the dollar. And if you look at it, industry, we know if you're uh, just you know picking companies, not because they're special, but they just come to mind, like a Southwest or a Caterpillar or a Flextronics or a Jable, something like that, they can be predictive in terms of what happens if part of their system goes down, if there's an earthquake somewhere, if there's some kind of natural disaster. They essentially have a self-healing network so that they know where to go. That's where we have to do with our sustainment and our logistics as well. And we're not quite there yet. We have some great you know, areas of opportunity. DLA is working closely with Transcom. Just lots of good things going on. But I think there's a lot more we can do and we can look a lot more like industry to do that. Okay, great. And I look forward to working with you on DAU. One of the things that I've been um, challenging to do in my conversations with them, um, like you say, they do an excellent job of teaching the acquisition process. 
And I think we need to lean a little bit more about teaching people to lead through the acquisition process. And that way we'll be a little less process dependent and give us a lot more flexibility. Yeah, and I think we have examples of some great contracting officers, some great program managers and PEOs out there. Those are the people we need to get to come and guest lecture at DAU exactly. and look at the examples of what's gone well. In fact, this is what I've talked um, to members of Congress and staffers about as well. You know, I think everybody's familiar with a bunch of people from DOD going to a hearing and getting a lot of tough questions about what really did not go well and why. What I would love to see is to pull up some program managers and contracting officers who have been creative and totally compliant within our acquisition system and have done some really great innovative things. Let's have a hearing and celebrate those successes and really broadcast those so others can leverage that. Yes, I think that's worth it. <laughs> Let's have a good hearing. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so. I think that'll be great. Okay, another question here. Organic and commercial industrial base. Mm -hmm. How do you envision the DOD organic industrial base working with and complementing the commercial defense industrial base? Okay, well, um, a lot more to do on that and a lot more we can do. Just to step back a moment, this administration is very focused on capability in the United States, especially from a manufacturing point of view, and especially for a defense industrial base. So there was an executive order that came out a little bit earlier this year, basically saying, what does the industrial base look like, the defense industrial base? Where's the fragility? Um, where do we need to invest and so forth. So ATNL through the MIBP office is leading that effort, um, supported very, very heavily um, by commerce and the whole of government. We have a great cross-functional team doing that. And what we're trying to understand is what is the fact set right now in terms of what is our defense industrial base, not just at the prime or one level down or two levels down, but seven levels down to see where we have shortages and oh, by the way, if we stress the system, if we did go to war in various places in the world and we had an increased demand signal, what if a certain part of the world was cut off in terms of supplying us? And what about if that demand signal got much, much stronger? Where then would we have these sole source um, situations? Or where would we not have the supply base? So we're trying to understand where we are there and where we're going and where we need to take um, all of the authorities that Congress has given us and the money Congress has given us to really bolster that base. But right now, what I think we will see is there's very little participation um, by commercial industry because it's frankly just too hard to do business with the DOD. Mm. And that's where we're trying to peel this back and simplify things. You know, there are lots of authorities we have out there to make it easier to procure. But getting back to the DAU opportunity, if you will, we're not training our acquisition professionals on how to do that. We are not showing them examples of how it can be done, how it has been done, and how they can do it as well. So we need to get out there and make it happen. We also um, need to really continue to engage with commercial industry. We have some good examples of that with things that DIUX is doing and others, but there's a lot more to come. So that is way up on my list because frankly, we want to look more commercial, but we've got a lot of peeling back to do um, to get there. And I think Congress is very willing as long as we have checks and balances in place. Okay, great. So we have another question here. Um, acknowledging the great work ongoing by the Section 809 panel to transform and modernize acquisition processes, what can be done today to accelerate solutions to fill gaps in capability today and move the DOD towards concepts already available in industry? Leadership. Leadership. Um, <laughs> one of the things I'm working on and have a couple of successes I hope we can talk about in the next couple of weeks is finding some leaders who have served and then been out in industry. 
so that they understand the context in which we're operating, what our requirements are, what needs to be done, but they've had the benefit of actually working in industry and seeing how things can be done commercially. So what we need are leaders that have had that experience who can work with the talent we have um, in DOD because there is a lot of talent. There are not a lot of people who have had the benefit of being out in industry as well. Um, just a different perspective. Yes. And what we're trying to do, again, is get some small wins, practice these behaviors, get case studies, and keep going. Excellent. And so I think it's not trying to solve it all at once, to be very clear, but making small little inroads, working with each of the services, and then really communicating what we did, why we did it, what it got us, and then doing more of it. Well, there was a question about the reorganization, which we've already addressed, but there was a small part at the end I want to ask you if you have any thoughts on. And it was, how will you know whether the reorganization is effective at speeding up the fielding of innovation? Have you had an opportunity to think about that, how you will perhaps measure the successfulness of the reorganization of innovation? Absolutely. It's when we start experimenting. Well, we prototype and we experiment and we demonstrate and we have quick iterations of capability. Because right now there is a lot in the pipeline and we just get very dragged out about it. And we've had some pretty exciting, I think, discussions when we bring people from the different service labs together with DARPA, um, with SCO, with DIUX, um, with SOCOM, and to get a group of about 10 people together and give them an objective and ask them to iterate. Um, and I think we're seeing some pretty exciting stuff. So we need to be able to go and grab something quickly and work on it and move forward. And what we're trying to do is get our acquisition executives who understand what our constraints are, um, what our abilities are, and to show how we can quickly get people on contract. So next year at this time, I want to talk about a lot of successes there. All right. Well, we will make a commitment to give you at least one from Army. There you go. There you <laughs> go. Right. I love that competition. All right. All right. So um, this is on divesting legacy programs. Um, we've heard a lot during AUSA that divesting is critical to Army modernization and probably to other services as well. And the question is, how can industry help the Army accomplish this? So I'm going to take a first step, but I would love to get your perspective on that. Um, yes, divestiture is very much a key part of the Army modernization process because I mentioned earlier we have over 800 programs. The Army, we have a lot of things that we hold on to for a long time because we're currently fighting today while we're trying to prepare for tomorrow. So we find ourselves with a lot of technology that we put out in the field to respond to quick reaction capability requests and ons and things of that nature. So what we're doing is trying to figure out what don't we need? Can we make headroom? Because even though um, we're not We've already procured it, and it's not taking a lot of money to buy it anymore. It takes money to sustain and support it and to keep the warehouses and things of that nature. So how can industry help? Um, one is to help us get the newer stuff out there faster. The reason we hold on to the older stuff is because we have to have something in the hands of our soldiers as soon as possible and when they need it. So if we have the latest and greatest capability out there early and as soon as possible, then that will help us with our divestiture. Yeah, I think I, I will build on that because I'm in total agreement. When I first came into the building, I sat down not only with the service acquisition executives, but each of the chiefs and each of the secretaries and asked about what I could do to help them meet their objectives. And one of the themes that came up again and again was to work with industry to get better quality faster. And the point that probably most often came up was operational availability um, of aircraft. And that is an incredible pain point right now. And there are new aircraft that are being delivered all the time that are frankly being picked over for spare parts um, to keep the existing fleet going. 
and it's hard to get rid of some of the old stuff when you can't get the hours you need out of the new stuff. So we've got to figure out all the way along what is it we're trying to build, how do we get it right the first time, and how do we keep the parts flowing. And there's lots of bits and pieces to that, but no kidding, high quality, low cost is what's going to help with that. Excellent. So this is kind of a personal mammal. We have the right to refuse any question that comes before us. <laughs> oh, let me see. What is this? <laughs> this is about your ethics agreement. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. So Everything's public in my life now. Okay. This is one of the things I've learned. <laughs> okay. So the question is, how many years are you disqualified from Textron defense issues? Are you also constrained on some Boeing issues because Textron and Boeing make the V-22 Osprey? I have no constraint on Boeing, however, I have two years on Textron, and I would say things like V-22, since that's part Textron, I'm excluded from that. So I will tell you, this is an incredibly thorough process in terms of ethics agreements, and everyone in my front office, yes. I mean the schedulers, everybody, know every stock I've ever owned, um, <laughs> every job I ever had, and what I can't be involved with. And the last thing I want to do is compromise the department. So I am very, very, very sensitive to that. And I am happy to say I've divested all my stock now, so those three shares of this and five shares of that are no longer encumbering me from um, being in meetings. But I will make no acquisition decisions on anything having to do with Textron. And frankly, I do not want to get close to any compliance issues, so I will err on the side of being very conservative about yes. that. And I can personally attest to that, because I've taken some issues to her, and as soon as the three-letter acronym comes, she's like, don't talk to me about that. I can't, nope, not me. So I can personally vouch that she and everyone in her office is um, very keen, and we appreciate yep. that. I appreciate that. So this is when DOD program managers have OSD obligation and disbursement targets, which are nearly impossible to hit with the environment of continuing resolutions. Okay. So okay. The, the result are inefficiencies, increased risk, and bad business decision. Is there an end to CRs in sight? And I think what they're getting If only at, I could answer <laughs> that question. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think um, we have our obligation rates, and they don't get modified based on when we actually get the budget. Like this last year, we were expected to have money obligated at the same rates we did if we had gotten money on October 1st. So do you see any change in that policy coming, or do you have a way to get rid of CRs and so that we'll get a budget yeah. every year? Unfortunately, I've not been able to touch any of that, um, <laughs> but um, believe me, it pains no one more than people in the department not to be able to get those done. But I think this harkens back, not on the CR side, which we're all working to get rid of, but in terms of the speed of getting on contracting. Um, there's a target out there in AT&L to de decrease the time it gets um, it takes to get on contract by 50%. And we're working hard on that right now. And we've talked to industry about it. We're working with the services. And no kidding, we're going to get at that. OK. All right, so this you talked about big data before and um, getting access to data. This is one, is data related and s and innovation. There's an opportunity to accelerate s and innovation is access to data. How do small and mid-sized companies working with the service lab gain access to data to conduct R&D that aligns with at &L's focus areas and priorities? Okay, I'm not clear on exactly what the data is you want, but whoever asked that question, if you can talk to me or somebody on my staff afterwards and I can get a little bit more clarity around that, I will put you in touch with Mary Miller, who has responsibility for R&E right now, 
And, um, you know, we want more than anything to get small businesses as well as medium-sized businesses working with the S&T community. So. Yeah, and the same thing for the Army. Um, Dr. Tom Russell is our S&T guy um, that handles that for the Army. And we are very much looking for small businesses and mid-sized businesses to get involved in some of our more innovative areas. I'm assuming the data may be information of what our priorities are and where to invest. So we'll share that with you as well. Okay, bringing technology to business operations. Currently, business process owners tend to report the acquisition or seem to expect the acquisition community to deliver technology rather than driving solutions. What do you see as your role in bringing more participation from business process? I can't get the last word. Owners. Okay, so currently business process owners tend to expect the acquisition community to deliver technology rather than driving solutions. What do you see as your role in bringing more participation from business process owners? Okay, I'm not clear exactly what we mean by business process owners there, but I think the key is that we need to deliver on whatever the requirement is for a product or service yes. to serve the gap that's out there that needs to be. And it sounds to me as if something is getting in the way of getting the real work done. So again, if someone wants to get back to me with a little bit more specific, maybe I can better address okay, that. Okay, because I'm, I'm not clear either. I don't know if there are here, but we'll get you afterwards. Um, I see you have mentioned lessons learned. What is the status of a DOD acquisition-wide lessons learned program that will enable risk management versus the now prevalent risk aversion because our personnel gets punished for perceived failures? Okay, so I think this goes back to something we talked about earlier. I think we talk a lot about what doesn't go well, and we don't talk very much about what does go well. And I think we need to capture what does go well and institutionalize that in a way that others can take advantage of. So I see really DAU as the place to get a lot of this done. Um, I think also that we need to make sure we have what I'll call more robust solutions earlier on in programs so that when we do have failures, it's not as catastrophic, it's not as costly. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with um, this breakup between ANS and R&E on the technology, on the product solution side. We really want to get out there and test it so that we know what we have in terms of a technology base before we craft a product so that we don't have all this concurrent engineering and development going on. Yes, and I think that's going to take a culture change. You know, right now, nobody wants their program to be this, you know, the case study at DAU or any other organization. <laughs> that's not seen as a positive thing. But some of the things you talked about, and I've heard others talk about as well, is that that's if we have to be able to embrace our failures. We talk about failing yeah. quickly and accepting that as an acceptable end state without yeah. you know, there being negative consequences completely associated yeah. with it. One of the lessons learned, I think, is that we, within DOD, and the majority of the industrial base, although there are pockets that are very good, we do not do software development very well mm -hmm. at all. And that's probably the starkest contrast, in my opinion, between the way the commercial sector and the defense industrial base is doing business. We have to get to agile software development. We have to be able to do DevOps because we are taking way too long to get code out there and we cannot wait for weeks and months to test. We need to be coding and testing every single day. And again, we have some great pockets of activity, but for the majority of our software development, we are years behind the commercial sector, and that's really 
hurting us in terms of where we rank, I think, among some of our adversaries. And that's one of the areas where it's causing our overmatch capability to be diminished. Yes. So if I had to hone in on one takeaway for everyone here in terms of where do we need to focus, where do we need to train, where do we need to practice new behaviors, it's software development. Thank you. I agree with that wholeheartedly. If you look across the risk and programs, a lot of it is there. So we have here on the acquisition business model. The preponderance, uh, well, the pendulum has swung from industry-driven spiral development to government taking back the role of lead system integrator, to government taking back the role of lead system integrator, and back again now. Where are we on this pendulum, and does it have to be either or? I, doesn't, I don't think it has to be either or. I think it's situationally dependent, and I think, frankly, as we try to do more across services and leverage developments from one service to the other, we need to do in DOD a better job of developing requirements um, so that again, we can have these modular architectures and we can take components and mix and match. And you know, if we're clever about this, we can take what we have in the installed base in terms of hardware and some software and create new software and recombine what we already have. So really, hopefully, the idea here is for an incremental investment, we could really get a step function change in capability because there's a lot out there that I think could be recombined to give us new um, mission capability. Well, I think that's um, thank you. I think that's a um, an interesting point. I, I want to kind of combine another question and and create one of my own a little bit for you. So it is related to this one. So there's a balance, right? There's industry has a desire to be the integrator. We're trying to build up our organic, you know, government workforce. Um, there's a question here about the arsenals, like workloading. How do we balance the workloading at arsenals, you know, with diminishing requirements in some cases, and then keep our industrial base viable at the same time from an industry perspective? So. From your viewpoint, having spent time in industry and now being on this side, do you think we can get to that delicate balance and that there's enough for everybody to get what they need to support our warfighters? Well, I think private-public partnerships are important yes, yes. and we need to continue to craft um, how they're actually constructed and then executed. Yeah. But there's an enormous amount of work to be done out there and I think it's finding where we have the best ability to do things quickly and affordably. Yes. And right now, um, one of the things in my portfolio is a lot of installations. Um, I would say that there's some capacity out there that could be better utilized. And one of the major investments industry has is capital investment in brick and mortar. I think we can be more creative about how we have government um, industry partnerships to utilize um, some of the bricks and mortar we have and the infrastructure that goes along with it to co-locate and do things a little bit more efficiently. I mean, we have enormous opportunity within just the logistics change chain in DOD. Quite often you will see multiple warehouses owned by different government entities side by side. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of rationalization we can do to better utilize that. Um, so I think there are different skill sets um, in industry and in government and the real key is when you can combine those. I think there's some great examples right now at depots where that's being done very well. Yes, and I think we've had a couple of successes in the Army with our government-owned contractor operated, you know, where we basically take a government facility that is being underutilized and allow industry to come in and use our facilities in order to <clears throat> produce a product or the service. So we're down to the last couple of minutes. I'm going to have to choose between the questions remaining. And I'm going to go with one on space. Okay, space. <laughs> yes. 
if the Air Force is forced by Congress to establish a Space Corps, should the Army give up its space programs and roll them into the Space Corps? That sounds like one for you. <laughs> um, well, that's an easy I, one. Um, I, no. <laughs> I'll tell you, um, space, I actually was in a big space meeting this morning. Space, um, there's a lot of debate going on right now. We have a lot of needs there. There's a lot of opportunity. And I think there is the beginning of a very, very good dialogue between Congress and the Pentagon on space right now. And we're right in the midst of it. And the leadership within the building right now has taken that very, very seriously. Secretary Wilson has put a lot of time and effort into that, as has the DepSec Def. And all of us are really looking at what do we have right now for a space architecture? Where are there gaps? How do we fill in the capability? And what is the best way to do that? And I think we're all in the process of rationalizing what we have in space, looking across the services, and making sure that we're looking at space as a domain, that all the services play in smartly and in a very complementary way. I will tell you what I mentioned software earlier and the fact that we have to get a lot better, a lot faster, um, a lot more agile with how we do software development. When you talk about the control stations for what we have in space, there really is a critical need to get better, smarter, faster, cheaper with what we do. Great. Well, the time went by extremely fast. So I just want to personally thank you for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule. Well, I appreciate um, the okay. invitation to come and meet with everyone. So thank you all for coming. And I'm glad that your first event was an Army event. So we'd like to give there you a you warm go. Army welcome and thank you. <laughs> thank you.